Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Hepatitis B, the added value of an accurate diagnosis for the optimization of the patient's clinical management. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoot, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Dia Soren. To learn more, visit them at diasoren.com. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of your presentation window or report your problem by clicking at the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Valentina Zieger, an associate professor of virology at the Department of Experimental Medicine at the University of Rome, Torvigata, Italy. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Zieger, you may now begin your presentation. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure for me to discuss today this topic, this important topic uh, with you. Considering a worldwide population of 7 billion individuals, 2 billion have been infected with HBV. Among them, 250 million have developed a chronic infection. Furthermore, it has been estimated that every year around 1 million HBV chronically infected patients die to the end-stage liver diseases such as cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. These numbers highlight the huge burden of HBV infection worldwide. Of course, the geographic distribution of a chronic HBV infection varies, reaching the highest prevalence in Western Pacific regions or in Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Africa, HBV is the major cause of death among viral hepatitis. What about Europe? According to the last ECDC estimates, the rate of a chronic HBV infection tended to remain stable over time, particularly during the last decade. And notably, the highest rate of a chronic HBV infection was observed in young adults, particularly aged from 25 up to 45 years. However, all these numbers, these prevalences are considered just the tip of the iceberg. Indeed, there is a large underestimation in the real prevalence of a chronic HBV infection, and this is mainly due to the limited intervention strategies aimed at HBV screening and diagnosis. But why is expanding access to HBV screening and diagnosis important? It is important since HBV plays a crucial pathogenetic role. Indeed, HBV is considered an important carcinogen, being responsible for around 50% of cases of liver cancer. In regions endemic for HBV infection, it has been estimated that around 70-80% of HCC cases can be attributed to HBV. Indeed, the risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma is 25-fold higher in patients with chronic HBV infection than in general population, 
and notably the risk to develop liver cancer still persist in individuals with resolved HBV infection. And this is mainly due to the persistence of HBV DNA in the liver of infected individuals despite the clinical resolution of the infection. We know that liver inflammation plays a pivotal role in the onset of liver cancer. Indeed, the persistent activation of cytotoxic T lymphocytes can favor repeated cycles of cell death and cell regeneration. These repeated cycles can promote genome instability, thus increasing the risk for the neoplastic transformation of the hepatocytes. However, unlike the other etiologies, HBV-related hepatocellular carcinoma can develop also in young adults and in complete absence of liver inflammation, so in complete absence of any signs of liver fibrosis or cirrhosis. And this is due to the fact that HBV is characterized by direct pro-oncogenic properties. First of all, HBV can integrate portion of its DNA into the hepatocytes genome, and this event of HBV DNA integration can favor, for instance, the upregulation of oncogenes, the loss of oncosuppressors, or can favor genome instability. Indeed, this concept is in line with this recent study presented at the Digital International Liver Con Congress promoted by ESL, showing that HBV DNA integration can act as a bridge for interchromosomal translocation. This interchromosomal translocation can promote genome instability and, as we have said before, this can increase the risk for the neoplastic transformation of the hepatocytes. Secondly, HBV genome encodes the so-called HBX protein. This protein is crucial for viral gene expression. However, when it is produced at very high levels, it can uh, induce, it can favor the expression of genes involved in cell proliferation, or it can inactivate P53, thus contributing, again, to the, an increased risk for the neoplastic transformation of the cell. Thirdly, the genetic variability in HBSAG can modulate HBV oncogenic potential. Indeed, previous studies have shown that the accumulation of deletions or stop codons in HBSAG can determine the production of aberrant or truncated forms of HBSAG that are retained, that accumulate inside the hepatocytes, thus promoting an oxidative stress and in turn increase the rate of cell proliferation. Based on these findings, a full suppression of viral replication by an early and a potent antiviral treatment is so far the only weapon we have to slow down the progression towards cirrhosis and towards hepatocellular carcinoma. In this light, a proper HBV screening and diagnosis is crucial for a timely identification of patients who are at risk of disease progression and thus who need to start an antiviral treatment. We know that the HBSAG is the hallmark for HBV diagnosis. We all know very well that the positivity to HBSAG indicates active viral replication and that the positivity for more than six months indicates the establishment of a chronic infection. 
However, beyond the qualitative detection, so far we have a number of essays allowing the quantification of the HBSAG. And HBSAG quantification plays an important role for a proper staging of a chronic HBV infection, for predicting the risk to develop liver cancer, and for monitoring treatment response. Let's talk about the first two points. We know that uh, chronic HBV infection is a highly dynamic phenomenon composed by different phases. Each phase derives from a delicate equilibrium between the extent of viral replication and the strength of immune response. In particular, the first phase of a chronic HBV infection is defined HBEAG positive chronic infection. This phase is characterized by elevated viral replication partially controlled or minimally controlled by the immune system. Indeed, in this phase, serum HBV DNA, so viremia is very, very high and the transaminases are normal. As soon as an efficient immune response is mounted, we have the entry into the so-called HBEAG positive chronic hepatitis, characterized by a decrease in serum HBV DNA and flares in transaminases. In this phase, we have an increased risk for liver inflammation, so an increased risk for cirrhosis and also for hepatocellular carcinoma. If the immune system prevails on the virus, we have the entry into the HBEAG negative chronic infection characterized by low serum HBV DNA, usually less than 2,000 international units per ml and normal transaminases. In this phase, the risk of disease progression is low, not absent, but very low. However, there's a fraction of individuals losing the favorable status of HBEAG negative chronic infection. Indeed, this fraction of individuals enters in the so-called HBEAG negative chronic hepatitis, characterized by periodic elevations in serum HBV DNA accompanied by flares in transaminases, followed by remission periods characterized by low serum HBV DNA and normal transaminases. A crucial diagnostic objective in clinical practice is to differentiate between HBEAG negative infection and the remission phase of HBEAG negative hepatitis. Indeed, these two phases, patients in these two phases are both HBEAG negative, have a low serum HBV DNA, less than 2,000 international units per ml, have persistently normal transaminases and a comparable intrahepatic reservoir. However, these two groups of patients have a completely different rate of disease progression. So, which is the parameter that can help us in uh, discriminating between these two groups of patients? This parameter is represented by HBSAG quantification. Indeed, the study shows that in patients with HBEAG negativity, low serum HBV DNA, and normal transaminases, an HBSAG less than 1,000 international units per ml can help predicting the status of HBEAG negative infection with a very high diagnostic accuracy and a very high negative and positive predicted value. 
These results are in line with these studies from an Asian group showing that the combination of low serum HBV DNA, low HBSAG, and the normal transaminases can help identifying patients with a minimal risk of disease progression. A completely different scenario is observed in patients with HBSAG higher than 1,000 international units per ml. Indeed, the study shows that in HBEAG negative patients with the low serum HBV DNA and the normal transaminases, having an HBSAG higher than 1,000 international units per ml correlates with an increased risk to develop liver cancer. At this regard, I would like to share with you this clinical case of a young man coming from West Africa with a chronic HBV infection. At Howard Hospital, this patient received a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, a single large nodule in complete absence of fibrosis. The patient died two months after receiving the diagnosis of liver cancer. The virological characterization of this patient showed that the patient was HBEAG negative. He had the serum HBV DNA low, only 700 international units per ml and the normal transaminases, and in line with the previous study, quantitative HBSAG was higher than 1,000 international units per ml. Furthermore, the sequencing of HBV genome revealed the presence of HBV genotype E. We know that uh, so far 10 HBV genotypes have been identified. Genotype E circulates with a higher frequency in West Africa. And furthermore, and notably, this genotype has been associated with a faster progression towards liver cancer than genotype D and A. So, overall findings support the role of quantitative HBSAG for a proper staging of a chronic HBV infection and to predict the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in the setting of HBEAG negativity. Furthermore, overall findings support the importance to integrate virological parameters for a full characterization of HBV pathogenetic potential. Let's talk about the role of HBSAG, quantitative HBSAG, in monitoring treatment response. We know so far there are two classes of anti-HBV drugs, interferon alpha and reverse transcriptase inhibitors, also called NUCLE. Let's talk about interferon alpha. We know that interferon alpha has the potential to reduce and to suppress viral gene expression, thus favoring the establishment of the HBEAG negative chronic infection and also the achievement of HBSAG loss. HBSAG loss is an important marker since it indicates the achievement of HBV functional cure. However, these important endpoints are achieved in clinical practice in a small proportion of patients, and this highlights the importance of virological parameters that can help predicting virological response to this drug. One of these parameters is represented by HBV genotype. We know that different HBV genotypes have a different rate of response to interferon alpha. The best virological response is observed in genotype A. Conversely, the worst virological response is observed in genotype D and has recently shown also in genotype E. Another important parameter for monitoring the response to interferon alpha 
is quantitative HBSAG, indeed has shown in the ESL guidelines and in several studies, the kinetics of HBSAG declines during uh, treatment with interferon alpha have helped to define the so-called stopping rule to interferon and thus to identify patients who need to stop, who need to suspend interferon alpha since they have a very limited probability for a successful response. What about NUC? We know so far that NUC, in particular entecavir and tenofovir, can efficiently suppress the activity of the reverse transcriptase enzyme, thus suppressing the production of major and infectious viral particles. This is translated in clinical practice in the achievement of virological suppression in the vast majority of treated patients. Furthermore, um, suppressing the production of viral particles can dampen liver inflammation and this can lead to the regression of fibrosis and cirrhosis and can also lead to a reduced risk to develop liver cancer. The risk is reduced even if it is not completely abrogated. What about HBSAG levels during nuke treatment? In HBEAG negative patients, HBSAG levels tend to remain stable during treatment or to undergo minimal decreases. A completely different scenario is observed in the setting of HBEAG positivity Indeed, in HBEAG positive patients, we observed higher declines in HBSAG compared to uh, HBEAG negative patients. And in particular, an HBSAG decline higher than one log during the first year of treatment can help identify those patients with a higher probability to achieve HBSAG loss and thus with a higher probability to achieve HBV functional cure. So, these findings support the role of quantitative HBSAG in predicting virological response to treatment with interferon alpha and in the setting of HBEAG positivity, quantitative HBSAG can help identify the, uh, the group of patients more prone to achieve HBSAG loss. But there are there factors that can affect HBSAG detection and quantification. A factor can be represented by HBSAG genetic variability, particularly in a region that is defined as major hydrophilic region. This major hydrophilic region of HBSAG is the target of neutralizing antibodies, but it is also the target of antibodies used by the majority of assays for HBSAG detection and quantification. So far, around 20 immune escape mutations all localized in the major hydrophilic region have been identified. Notably, these mutations can alter, can hamper HBSAG recognition by neutralizing antibodies, including those induced by the vaccine, and also by diagnostic antibodies, thus affecting the proper HBSAG detection and quantification, which is the prevalence, the, the circulation of these immune escape mutations. We have analyzed a large data set composed of more than 900 patients infected with HBV genotype D 
And we have found that around 18% of patients harbor viral strains with at least one immune escape mutation. And notably, the presence of these immune escape mutations, particularly when combined, correlates with HBSAG negativity. So with a negative result despite ongoing viral replication and thus despite detectable serum HBV DNA, thus supporting the role of these mutations in hampering the proper HBSAG recognition. What about immune escape mutations in other HBV genotypes? Some immune escape mutations detected in genotype D can be constitutively found in other HBV genotypes. This means that an amino acid associated with an immune escape phenotype in genotype D can be the wild type amino acid in another genotype. As shown in this interesting study, this can lead to differences in antigenicity profiles among HBV genotypes. So this means that this can lead to differences in HBSAG recognition by neutralizing antibodies and also by diagnostic antibodies. And of course, faster studies are necessary to better elucidate this important point from a pathogenetic and diagnostic point of view. A clinical setting in which immune escape mutations play a pivotal role is represented by immune suppression-driven HBV reactivation. Immune suppression-driven HBV reactivation is defined as an abrupt increase in serum HBV DNA in patients with a chronic HBV infection or an abrupt reuptake, an abrupt reappearance of HBV DNA in patients with resolved HBV infection. Again, we should remember that in patients with resolved HBV infection, we have the persistence of HBV DNA whose transcriptional activity is tightly controlled by the immune system. Due to the uh, ever-increasingly use of immune-suppressive agents, HBV reactivation can so far occur in a large variety of clinical settings, and if not properly managed and treated, it can lead to severe forms of hepatitis, including fulminant hepatitis that can lead to patients' death. Different studies, including one from our group, has shown that there's a fraction of patients with HBV reactivation who are HBSAG negative despite HBV reactivation, and so despite ongoing viral replication and elevated levels of the serum HBV DNA. The analysis of HBSAG uh, sequences revealed the presence of a peculiar type of immune escape mutations. In particular, the analysis of HBSAG sequences revealed the enrichment of mutations associated with the acquisition of the so-called additional and link glycosylation sites is an N-link glycosylation site. A, an N-link glycosylation site is a signal motif composed by only three amino acids that is responsible for the attachment for the binding of a carbohydrate shield. This carbohydrate shield can mask the uh, epitope surface, thus uh, hampering, altering the proper HBSAG recognition by neutralizing antibodies, but also by diagnostic antibodies. And this can explain the HBSAG negative result observing patients with HBV reactivation. 
So based on these findings, it is important the use of innovative assays for HBSAG detection and quantification targeting HBSAG regions, HBSAG domains other than the major hydrophilic one. This is the case, for instance, of the liaison murex assay based on the use of uh, different monoclonal antibodies targeting multiple epitopes uh, throughout the HBSAG protein. And this is feasible thanks to the use of a specific agent allowing the detachment of HBSAG from viral envelope followed by its denaturation. The denaturation is a crucial step allowing the exposure of new epitopes. We have quantified a set of biological samples, plasma samples from patients with different immune escape mutations and HBSAG quantification by liaison murex SA was successful for all patients. Another important biomarker for the management of patients with a chronic HBV infection is represented by HBEAG. We know that positivity to HBEAG is uh, uh, indicative of high levels of viral replication, and uh, usually HBEAG is uh, uh, positive during the first two phases of a chronic HBV uh, infection. During the uh, natural course, uh, the natural history of a chronic HBV infection, as we have seen before, the loss of HBEAG is uh, considered a favorable prognostic uh, marker. Indeed, different studies have shown that HBEAG loss implying the entry into the HBEAG negative chronic infection is associated with a, a reduced risk to develop cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma and it is also associated with a higher probability to achieve HBSAG loss and thus HBV functional cure. Similarly, in HBEAG positive patients receiving treatment, HBEAG loss is an important therapeutic endpoint that has been associated with long-lasting therapeutic response and also with clinical improvement. Beyond the qualitative detection of HBEAG, so far, there are essays allowing HBEAG quantification, and the different studies have um, evaluated the role of quantitative HBEAG in predicting HBEAG loss during treatment. In particular, this study has shown that a one-log decrease in HBEAG levels at week 12 of treatment can help identify patients more prone to achieve undetectable serum HBV DNA and also more prone to achieve HBEAG loss. Similarly, this study led in uh, HIV plus HBV co-infected patients shows that a specific combination of quantitative HBSAG and quantitative HBEAG can again help identify patients with a higher probability to achieve HBEAG loss. At this time, I would like to share with you our experience on the quantification of HBEAG. In particular, we quantify different uh, samples by using the liaison assay for HBEAG quantification. By using serial dilution, we found that the assay shows a very high linearity and a very high reproducibility. 
we quantified HbEAG levels in different phases of HBV infection, in particular in the setting of acute infection in patients with HbEAG positive chronic infection, HbEAG positive chronic hepatitis, and also in the setting of HBV reactivation. The highest levels of HbEAG were observed in patients with acute infection and in patients with HBV reactivation. Indeed, in these two settings, viral replication is particularly high. Conversely, the lowest levels were observed in patients with HbEAG chronic hepatitis. Indeed, this phase is characterized by a stronger immune response against the virus that can control HbEAG production and, more in general, viral replication. Interestingly, uh, we observed a positive correlation between HbEAG levels and HbSAG levels in all group of patients analyzed. Conversely, in acute infection and in patients with HbEAG positive chronic hepatitis, we found a negative correlation between HbEAG levels and ALT and transaminases. Again, this result can uh, be explained, can support the uh, modulation in HbEAG production by the immune system. Finally, we focus the attention on patients with HBV reactivation uh, who started an antiviral therapy for more than 12 months. In this group of patients, ALT normalization was observed in the vast majority of them. HbEAG loss was observed in 50% of patients and undetectable serum HbV DNA in 60% of patients. Interestingly, we identified a specific combination of quantitative HbSAG and quantitative HbEAG that can help identify patients more prone to achieve HbEAG loss during treatment, again highlighting the importance to integrate virological parameters for an optimized management of patients with HBV infection, also in the setting of immune suppression. So, in conclusion, the huge distribution of HBV infection and its pathogenetic uh, potential uh, strongly support the importance for a proper HBV screening and monitoring. And this is uh, crucial for a timely identification of patients who are at higher risk of disease progression and thus who need to start an antiviral treatment. Quantitative HBSAG plays an important role for a proper staging of patients and to predict the risk of liver cancer, particularly in the setting of HbEAG negative patients. It is also important to monitor treatment response, particularly to interferon alpha. And we should remember the importance of assays targeting multiple HbSAG epitopes to overcome the issue of immune escape mutations. So far, the quantification of HbEAG is feasible in clinical practice. HbEAG levels vary during the different phases of HBV infection, and according to the literature, quantitative HbEAG can play a role in identifying patients more prone to achieve a, the HbEAG loss that is, as we have seen before, an important and favorable outcome in, um, during the natural history of chronic HbV infection. 
Finally, the integration of virological biomarker is pivotal for an optimized management of patients with HBV infection. And I thank you for the attention. And thank you, Dr. Zvicker, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. So let's take a look. We already have some great questions coming in from our audience. Dr. Zvicker, in patients with HBE ag negative chronic infection, is there a threshold of HBSAG that can predict the loss? Thank you for this uh, for this question. In uh, HBEAG negative uh, chronic infection, the rate of uh, uh, HBSAG uh, loss increases by by age and it has been estimated to be around 3% per year in individuals older than uh, 50 uh, years. Previous studies have shown that uh, in this setting of patients, an HBSAG less than 100 international unit per ml can help identify patients more prone to achieve HBSAG loss. So this means that an HBSAG less than 100 international unit per ml that can reflect a limited intrahepatic reservoir can help identify patients with a higher probability to achieve HBV functional cure. Furthermore, it has been also shown that an HBSAG less than 100 international unit per ml is usually preceded by a decline, a strong decline in HBSAG levels, presumably uh, driven by uh, an, an activation of immune response. Thank you so much, Dr. Speaker. Our next question is, is there a role of quantitative HBSAG in predicting the risk of vertical transmission? Thank you so much for this interesting uh, question. Vertical transmission of HBV infection is an important topic responsible for uh, the uh, large distribution of HBV infection in a different uh, regions wor worldwide. According to the EASL guidelines, an HBSAG higher than 4 log uh, international unit per ml can help identify mothers uh, who have a higher probability to transmit uh, the virus to their newborns. And so this uh, threshold of HBSAG can help identify mothers uh, who need to start uh, an antiviral treatment in order to reduce the risk for uh, HBV vertical transmission and eventually to reduce the amount of uh, transmitted virus. Thank you so much. And again, I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Dr. Speaker, why are HBS AG levels more stable in HBE AG negative patients than in HBE AG positive ones? Thank you. This is another interesting question, and the answer is related to the capability of HBV to integrate its DNA. We have seen before that HBV can integrate portions of its DNA into the uh, hepatocytes genome. This event has been uh, linked to hepatocarcinogenesis. Indeed, it is considered an important mechanism underlying HBV uh, oncogenetic potential. However, HBV DNA integration can also uh, be a source for the production of uh, viral proteins. It has been estimated that the rate of HBV DNA integration 
is higher in HbEAG negative patients. And in particular, in these patients, HbV DNA integration can represent a source for the production of HbSAG. So HbSAG can derive either from CCC DNA and either from integrated HbV DNA, and this is responsible for the stability of HbSAG levels observed during treatment. Thank you so much. And Dr. Speaker, we have time for one more question. Our audience member asks, which is the prevalence of immune escape mutations in HBV genotypes other than D? Again, thank you for these uh, questions. We have seen before that uh, some immune escape uh, mutations can be constitutively found in uh, HBV genotypes other than D. However, immune escape mutations can be also generated during, the, uh, during viral replication, even if the prevalence of patients with uh, at least one immune escape mutation is lower in uh, HBV genotypes other than uh, D. In particular, overall, genotype D is characterized by a higher degree of genetic variability. Indeed, it is characterized by a faster accumulation of immune escape mutations, also of mutations in the basal core promoter, and presumably this higher degree of genetic variability can be explained by a stronger uh, immune uh, response against this uh, genotype. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Speaker, and your presentation. Would you like to provide any closing remarks for our audience before we go? Oh, I, I just would like to stress that, that it has been a great uh, pleasure for me today to talk about the importance of a proper diagnosis, a proper monitoring of HBV. Indeed, uh, despite uh, the availability of a vaccine, despite the availability of potent uh, drugs against this virus, HBV HBV still represents an important cause of morbidity and mortality. And a proper HBV diagnosis, a proper monitoring is crucial to uh, optimize the management of patients, to identify patients at risk of disease progression, and to start a, a, a treatment, an antiviral treatment. Dr. Speaker, it's been an honor. Thank you again for your time and your important research. And I also want to take the moment to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Dia Sorin, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, thank you to the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And as a reminder, questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share this email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.